So welcome to this next session, the principles of data modeling with MongoDB. Danielle Kupal, um, a staff developer advocate, is gonna be out here uh, teaching this to you. He's actually been at MongoDB almost nine years. He has done everything from being a technical services to a consultant, and he's even trained the people who also teach MongoDB. He actually taught me when I joined about five years ago, so I'm really, really happy. And this particular talk that he gives about data modeling, he's been talking about it for a long time. It's really, really, really effective. I, I would say easily he's helped thousands and thousands of customers like improve their performance. And, and so I hope you guys get a lot out of this talk. Let me um, see if I forgot anything. So. He's done a lot of courses, presentations, blogs. He's gonna to talk to you about uh, MongoDB University. Hopefully there's time. You probably won't have time for questions after this because it's really, really packed. Um, but he is doing an Ask the Experts panel with our other uh, fantastic trainer, Asya, and that's gonna be 425 in the other room, 425 this afternoon. So if you don't get what you want out of here, go to Ask the Experts panel with him later this afternoon. And with that, Please welcome Daniel Kupal. And he knows every restaurant. <laughs> when I started my career, there were two ways you could reach someone. You could call them on their phone at home, or you could call them at work. How many of you still have a phone at work? Yeah, today we have you know, a cell phone, we have a Skype account, we have a Zoom account, uh, WhatsApp, and whatever next thing's gonna be invented next month. So if this is great for all of us, well, maybe it's not as great for people who did this kind of design many years ago and have done some. The great thing is, you no, know, if you, the design is still alive, it's because it was a successful application. But when we modeled people a long time ago, we would have a table with a column for a home phone and column for the work phone. Well, that doesn't work anymore. So how do you go and modernize these applications without downtime? So that's one of the things we'll be talking about today. So welcome to my talk, Principle of Data Modeling with MongoDB. Thanks, Karen, for the introduction. Um, so I've worked on a lot of things related to data modeling. If you know my name, uh, it's probably because of the MongoDB class on university, all the blogs I've written on the subjects. I'm really passionate about everything that I'm modeling with MongoDB. So uh, I'm gonna divide the presentation into three segments. First, we're gonna talk a little bit about the need to model for NoSQL. And then we're gonna introduce a methodology, very simple, that you guys can follow. It's gonna guide you on how you do a model for MongoDB. And finally, I'm gonna dig a little bit more into one uh, design pattern uh, they call it schema versioning. That's my favorite pattern. I think this is like the, one of the most uh, underrated feature of MongoDB. So let's get going. The need to model for SQL, the need to model for anything. We need to model because we need to face an answer to constraints. If there are no constraints, there's no need to model. I like to use the example of air. You know, we don't model for air, we just breed it because it's abundant and our system's working well with it. Well, not all the time. If you go in space or you go in the water, you need to model for it. So when you model for a system, you're gonna have constraints that are physical. Hey, if you want your data to be accessible uh, in the US from someone who's in Australia, well, there's no latency. You, you know, that's physical limitation. You can't go over this one. You may have some hardware constraints. Uh, disk is cheap, but it's slow. So what's the alternative? You can use RAM, but RAM is more expensive. So you need to do compromise on that. And that's what your model basically is trying to go around. Uh, you may have constraint from the software. You're using MongoDB. There's a maximum size for the document. There's features that may not exist right now that you would like to use or that no one has think of and will invent later. So this talk obviously will concentrate on the uh, features of MongoDB that can help you go over those constraints. Uh, but the principle I'd like to get out of that, it is imperative to know the features of the products you use. So for MongoDB, uh, typical ones that, you know, when you do data modeling always come to mind, the data model, the document model, the indexes, sharding. But then there's newer ones, you know, transactions, field level encryption, data federation, archive, the nice, an interesting thing about these 
last three that I named, they were not there when I joined MongoDB. You would have done the design in those years, you would have had to do it in a different way. For example, if you wanted to model a transaction in the early days, yeah, you can always use the document model by itself, avoid transaction, but if you had to do transaction, it would have been a double commit. Now we do have native SQL-like transaction in MongoDB. Uh, even for shadow cluster, they look exactly like what you use in a relational database. Field level encryption, uh, or queryable encryption that we rename it after the last version. That's really one of the most incredible security feature out there. We're the only one, the only database in the world that does that. So that's pretty cool. You could try to do it yourself with managing all the keys, but it would be extremely complex. Built it in MongoDB. Um, seems like it's piling the little things here. Uh, archiving data. Sure, you could have done it with different collections in the past, but now it's built in MongoDB. You know, you can use archives. Search, we just added that recently. So you don't have to have two different systems. You know, we have search uh, that is as good as Elasticsearch. We're using the same technology in the background. And it's all through a single API. So obviously, you know, a lot was said about that and there's other presentation I will do probably more justice. Okay, so for this presentation, what we're gonna do, we're gonna have a little example. We're gonna build a social network for Chef, where Chef's gonna be writing articles. Uh, we're gonna categorize those articles, and then we'll have our users comment on those. So if I was going to give you this problem, all of you, uh, and model it with an ER diagram for a relational database, you would all come with that solution. Why? Because there's only one solution that is on the third normal form that respect all the different relationship between the objects. So it's pretty easy if you think about it to do an ER diagram for a relational database. If I ask you to do it for MongoDB, maybe you will come with one collection, or two collection, or even something else. So which one is the best solution if there's many possible solutions? Well, the optimal grouping of objects into collection is determined by the workload. And this is, again, not just for MongoDB, it is for any NoSQL solution. So that brings us to the second part of our talk where we're gonna introduce a little methodology that you can use to get you there. So methodology is gonna be very simple. We're gonna have a workload. After that, we're gonna describe the relationships, and then we're gonna apply patterns. So for those of you who follow here and try to make a correspondence to uh, the relational world, Yes, in the relational world, we do start with the ER diagram, and after we write the code, we may figure out something is not good enough, we don't want to denormalize, but we do take care of the data model first. And with MongoDB, we do the opposite. We need to take care of the workload first, and then we'll do the data model. And again, this is not just for MongoDB, this is because we have big data, we have NoSQL. So that first phase of taking care of the workload, what do we want out of it? We want to size the data. We want to identify the operations that are going to be running the most often, the most important ones. We want to quantify them. You know, how often do they run per unit of time? Um, then we want to qualify them. Maybe there's other characteristics that are important for those queries. That's going to make us understand what the system should be doing. An example with our little uh, system here, we're going to have new articles written by our chef. We got about 10 per day, but those are extremely important because that's the core for a system. We, don't, we can't be having something happening and losing some of those. And then we're gonna have comments um, that our user are gonna be writing. And then we're gonna have users reading from our system. And this is really important. We want the users to have a very good experience. They come to the website, they want to read an article, it has to come up like very quickly, otherwise no, they'll go somewhere else. And then we may have analytics queries. Um, those won't run as often, but the important thing is if we know we're gonna have those that make us think that maybe we want an analytical node that's gonna be different, that's not going to disturb our workload. So in, in summary, we want, to load, we want to list all the important operation on our system. Once we do that, it's usually, most of the time, it's gonna become clear that one or two of these queries are the ones that are gonna drive your design. These are the high velocity that Rick was referring to uh, earlier today. So um, reading an article, we get 10 million a day. 
That's really what we want to use here to model our system. So, but before we do that, let's just ensure we understand that query. So this is where it's important to go and detail a little bit more of the operation. So the thing I like about writing all that down, sometimes we have it in your head, but writing it down, it's gonna help you act uh, on it if something changed. So we can best act on a new hypothesis only if we know what was the original hypothesis. My original hypothesis was 10 million reads per day. What if I get a million, uh, I get 100 million? You know, what's the impact on my system? So yeah, we're gonna get it wrong, but at least, you know, we know we want a model for that. So out of that first phase, we had a good description of the workload. Now we're gonna look at the relationships. And relationships are always the same between objects. Relationship between my first name and my last name is a one-to-one. -one. Relationship between me and my credit card is a one-to-many. It doesn't matter if you're in NoSQL, relationships are always there. So we're gonna identify the relationships gonna quantify them, which is a little bit different than the relational uh, modeling uh, exercise. And then we're gonna answer the most important question when you do your model from MongoDB. Should you embed or uh, reference the uh, different uh, entities? And I like the analogy of relational relations between a relational database um, to, to a car. I have a car, I bring it home at the end of the day, and I want to put it in the garage. Well, in a relational database, you would take the car, put all the wheels on one table, put all the seats on another one, put the brakes on another one. If you were using a MongoDB garage, you would just park the car in. You know, in MongoDB, what is used together in the application is stored together in the database. Make things so much, much easier. Okay, so how do we know if we should reference or we should embed? But before we go there, I just want to be sure it's clear what we mean by referencing and embedding. So linking or referencing is pretty much what you would do with a relational database. That's the only option you have. If I have two entities, I uh, have a relationship between the two, well, in MongoDB, you decide that you're gonna also carry that relationship to two different collections or two different documents. On the other hand, Embedding is basically taking one of the entity and putting it in. So the document model, basically, what is it? It has two main constructs. It has a subdocument and it has an array. And the array is the expression of a one-to-many relationship. So if I take the comments for the articles, so I have a relation to one-to-many, and I embed it, this is what I get, only one collection with the two entities in it. So note the numbers here. Um, zero, 1,000, one is the minimum, the other one's the maximum. Uh, there's also, sometimes I put like the most likely number. Why I think those numbers are more important than just many, you know, that's what we've been used to in the relational database. Again, this is because it's big data. You know, in the old world, relationship N was never that high, but now you model Twitter and you can have like 20 million users to have followers. But you don't want to embed the 20 million followers inside one document, you know, that's gonna be too big. So if you take the time to write those, it's gonna help you understand your model. Okay, so now that we know that, let's go back to the rules. When would I reference? When the many side is a huge number, again, if you have like, like 10 million followers, you don't want to embed that in your main document. Integrity on the right operation, many to many. I need to write to two places, and I don't want to have duplication, can use a transaction in MongoDB, that's probably a good example where you would like to reference. When I take a piece of information, and there's only one little part I'm using all the time, the rest is not used, don't bring that in memory. So that's a case where splitting it, even if it's a one-to-one -one relationship, would be a good example to use a reference. Embedding, integrity of read operation. Sure, you can do a read through a transaction, and it's gonna be, gonna get integrity on that, but the document model, the document itself is ACID. So if you embed the things, you get everything together. No need for transaction. For the integrity of right operation on one-to-one -one or one-to-many, if you keep things together in one document, everything about referential integrity, cascading delete and all that, you can take your document, just you know, get rid of it, and they all go together. So one write to the document, again, is always atomic. For data that is deleted, as just said, or archived together. Think about it, if you want to do archives with a relational database, you would like to archive a subset of rows. 
Those rules will only make sense when you try to retrieve them if you've also archived all the joins to which you're doing at that given time. It's kind of complicated. With MongoDB, if you model your thing so you have a document and it's self-content, does all the information, it's very easy to archive it because you can retrieve it later and it has everything it had at that time. And the last rule, finally, is by default. You should prefer embedding to referencing when you're on the fence. Usually your code's gonna be much simpler. Uh, it's gonna match what's, you know, you're using the code. Uh, so, and I like simplicity. So embedding usually tend to lead to simpler systems. Okay, so out of that second phase, we still have something that's normalized. It's not because it's in a document, it's not normalized. It's still normalized, it just decided to embed things, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is apply patterns. So we're gonna identify a situation where we can apply them and we're gonna apply them. And this is where we're gonna get like good performance, easier use in the application. So the patterns are based on this idea of these guys, Eric Gamma and his friends. Many years ago, they wrote this book. How many of you have read this book? A few. So the great thing about this book was not just that they catalog all the different patterns for architecture and software engineering, it's that they named them. You would go in a room with other people who've read the book, and when you start, start talking about facade, observer, and all that, they won't know exactly what you're talking about. So that's what we want to do here with the patterns. If I talk about an extended reference, my definition is not different than yours. So here we have uh, 12 patterns that you know, we classified across the most common use cases we see across our customers. And I put some like check mark to they give a good idea of which pattern is the mostly used in all of these applications. But the key thing here is to get the list of all those patterns. So this is a very short presentation. I don't have all the time to go all over that. It's in our class. It's in the blogs. I'll give you a reference to that. But let's quickly go over a solution with it. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the schema versioning one. So an extended reference pattern. Instead of bringing people inside my article, I may just have a reference to it, but not just having the ID, but the name, so I don't have to read this thing all the time. I'm just gonna have the important information. Another pattern may be the number of comments, so I'm gonna pre-compute it, so I don't have to count all the time. So we call this one the computed pattern. A subset, you don't want to embed all the comments. You know, in the article, most people don't care about the thousand comments on an article. They just care about either the last 10, the 10 most useful one, so what we can do, we can just like stick those inside the document, the main document that we're gonna read all the time, and when there's a need to get more information, we're gonna go fetch it. So this one is called a subset pattern. So again, this is going very fast, but it's just to show you that, you know, remember the original solution we put there? In this case, we had three collections. And finally, the schema versioning pattern, which is as simple as having a schema version field and using it correctly uh, in, in, the, in the process. And that brings us to the last part of this presentation, so evolving the model with the schema versioning pattern. Any successful system will go through changes, likely including data model changes. Typical changes are as simple as field modification. Relational database do that very, very well, you know, alter table and then change the type or add a column, that's pretty easy. Modifying a relationship in a relational database, that's pretty complicated. And this is just simple, you know, real modification of schema in, in, in the world is like a lot of those happening at the same time. So how would you do that with uh, a relational database? Well, we have a version one of our data. We have our users, they have a home phone, they have a work phone. And we want to go to that because we're just realizing there's a lot more than these two columns. There's a lot of communication modes. So, we're gonna create this one-to-many relationship to the communication mode to accommodate Alton Brown to just join our, uh, our system. So on Friday night, we're gonna shut down the system, and then we're gonna do a migration from one table to two tables, and then on Monday morning, we'll be up and running, and all the data would have been reformatted. Now let's do the same with MongoDB. We have our Documents, we have on phone, work phone, Alton comes in, 
just make us realize we need to do something. We're going to create a sub-document called communication, which express the one-to-many relationship. It could be in a different collection. It's going to be exactly the same process at this point if it was in a different collection. And we're going to stick in a version number. This is not a version of the content of the document. This is a version of the schema that document is using. And this is where all the magic happens. When you're in a relational database, you have one version number for the whole database. You go from one to two. In MongoDB, we're going to piggyback on the polymorphism of the document model. Each document can be a little bit different, but we're going to use that. So we can have documents that are in shape one or in shape two, in version one, version two. So on Friday night, we have all our documents in version one, and that's what we want on Monday morning. Everything has been migrated to V2. We're going to go and migrate the documents one by one. As long as the application is able to read the, document, the, the, the documents in different shape at a given time, we're OK. So that means we need to modify the application first, have a section of the code that knows how to do, deal with version 1, have another section of the code that, needs to, need, that knows how to deal with version 2. And if we do that, there's no downtime. We can take you know, all the time we want in the world to do a full migration or do just migrate the documents we want. If we migrate everything, we can remove the code that handled version 1. But it gives us a lot more flexibility. We are in control. We are in the driving seat of doing this like, ugly modification. And no downtime. And this is obviously a simple use case. But you, could, you can extend that to nearly everything, which means you can do modification on schema without downtime. So MongoDB not lets you just develop and deploy quickly, but also evolve your application and your schema quickly. And this is, you know, this is what you need today uh, from application. You know, applications are used 24 hours a day, all over the world, and you want this functionality. So you're investing basically in your future by using MongoDB and using that schema. So conclusion uh, for this talk, uh, we divided the talk into three different sections and add these principles. So what did we get? So the need to model. It's imperative to know the features and the product you're using. The optimal grouping of the objects into collection is determined by the workload. So having a good description of the workload will get you a long way. And then the technique for modeling, we can best act on hypothesis if we know the original hypothesis. And probably the main sentence that you have to remember as you're doing your models, what is used together in the application is stored together in the database. And finally, when it's time to involve the model, any successful system will go through changes, likely including data model changes. So MongoDB lets you develop and deploy quickly, but also evolve your application and schema quickly. So to learn more, we have a series of blogs on patterns. So that table that I show. But we also have a series of blogs on anti-patterns, what not to do. And we link that to some features in Atlas that can detect automatically that you're doing something wrong. For example, if your main query is using a dollar lookup to join something. So every time you're using an object, you have to go fetch another one. That's a good sign that these two things should be together. So the blogs will point you to the rules. And again, Atlas is there to be, to be your friend. Um, the other thing we have is MongoDB University. How many of you have done a class on MongoDB University? So well, that's not a lot. It's really not enough. OK. MongoDB University is free. OK? We're not trying to make money here. We're trying to get you to use MongoDB correctly. We want you to be successful. If you are successful and you get this ah uh, moment using MongoDB, you're going to come back for more. You're going to develop all your new projects on MongoDB. So we want you to be successful. Go take the classes. M320 is. Uh, basically, you know, what I'm presenting today is like the short, condensed, so super condensed version of the class. But there's another class I, I like. It's M100. It's MongoDB for SQL Pro. And what we're trying to do in that class is for all of you who are kind of new to MongoDB but have a lot of relational expertise to get you from one place to another one. It's a very simple class. It's two hours. No homework. No tests. Very easy. Uh, 
Uh, it's about the time to watch one movie on Netflix, okay? So remove one movie from your queue and watch that. And it's gonna make you feel good that all the knowledge that you accumulated over the year you know, through a relational database, these things still exist in MongoDB. Yeah, you know, there are things that you need to start thinking a little bit differently, but at the end, it's still a database. There's a lot of concepts that are exactly the same. And finally, if you have a huge project and you need help, you know, we have our professional services. Um, I would qualify professional services or engineers, consulting engineers in that group, would be the most qualified, the most knowledgeable people we have uh, at MongoDB. So these people can go to your place. They can help you uh, jumpstart a project. They can help you verify that what you're about to deploy in production makes sense. They can teach you things. So and again, they're super knowledgeable, but if there's something they don't know, they have the whole team behind them, so they can come back to the office and ask the people and get you the answer for that. So uh, extremely valuable for new projects. Um, and here I put uh, some QR code to the tree reference there, the university in patterns and into patterns. So thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, Dallas. This is, this is an amazing stage. Uh, I don't think I've ever been in a stage as nice as that in my whole life. So thank you for welcoming me here. <laughs> if you have any questions, as Karen said, on data modeling, Asya, uh, Asya who's probably the most knowledgeable person on MongoDB in the whole world, uh, will be with me at 4.30 in the, in the other room, and we'll take any questions uh, you may have on, on the subject. So again, thank you everyone, and um, this is a QR code for uh, rating your session. Oh, I have three minutes left, so if someone has a question, <laughs> I went faster than expected. Anyone have any questions? Oh, what a treat. I mean, not that you don't have questions, but that we have three minutes. And no pressure, you can come later at 4.30 to ask the question. Yeah. They're gonna try and stump you. I've always wanted to do this with like one of those dunking pools. You know, like you sit on the thing and you can't answer it, they get through. Maybe next Is time. Is it hidden somewhere? I'm going to have a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, everyone.